coming tonight. I'm happy to introduce James Lowry, who founded Earth Skills in 1987. And this is, he's done a ton of classes on wilderness survival and tracking. And I've had, I've been lucky enough to have that class through my work and he, him and his wife are just amazing. And it was a great, it was a great class and I learned a lot from it. Um, and he is, and he's going to talk about mammal tracking today. So yeah, and he's very arguably an expert in, in tracking and in mammal tracking and animal tracking. So thank you so much, James, for joining us. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, and those of you who had to uh, bump from our previously scheduled date, I apologize for that inconvenience. I'm glad we could uh, pull it off though. And I'm glad it's being recorded because we'll get a little bigger audience, hopefully. So uh, yeah, my name is Jim Lowry. Um, my wife here is attending also, Mary Brooks, and she has been a co-teacher uh, for many, many years in all of our tracking workshops. So. Uh, she's here to correct me when I say the wrong thing or forget the right thing. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah, we have an hour to cover a really big subject. And of course, it's only going to be an introduction. But um, some of you have been in uh, our classes before. Some of you are new. And um, some of you may have done tracking a little bit or do it in the field. Um, and again, some may be completely new to this. So. Um, if you have been out in the field doing tracking, one thing you notice is that if you have a really beautiful, clear track, it's not that hard to identify. You can use your field guides, your method, and um, and compare similar species and come up with it. Uh, but there are times, and those of you who may have been um, involved, well, for example, um, dusting the outside of a potential um, kid fox den or uh, dragging, uh, preparing um, uh, track um, surfaces, you know, track um, stations for research. Uh, you've obviously noticed that tracks are not always clear prints. They're windblown. They're um, disturbed by tons of other tracks. They're old. They may be a week old, a month old, and still um, the 95% of the tracks that you are not going to have an easy time with a demand that you do um, a methodical uh, approach. And so basically what I'm going to do um, this evening is just go through a methodology and with a bunch of examples, and I'll give you um, some time to um, to pose some questions a couple of times during it. Um, but the other reason uh, to use a methodology besides the fact that you got more raw material is that, um, you know, when you're not doing a, a research project and you're just walking in the field on a dirt road or on animal trails or whatever, there's a ton of evidence there that you can access that you're not going to see if you put trail cameras up or if you put track stations up. There's a huge amount of information. I actually uh, was involved um, a number of years ago in a um, research project at Edwards Air Force Base, mammal that used mammal tracking quite a bit. And so um, we had a lot of, um, of uh, camera stations set up. And um, so I was kind of a, um, a quality control person and trainer for that whole project. And uh, I would go out sometimes with the biologists when they would uh, retrieve the, you know, the cards from the, uh, from the cameras. And while they were doing that, I would sometimes sneak around the perimeter of the area where the camera was. And uh, you wouldn't be surprised to know that a lot of animals uh, came close to the camera, came around it, underneath it, behind it, without ever triggering that. So um, anyway, there's a lot of information out there if you just use the right methodology. So um, what I'm going to do is, um, is share screen now, and we're going to um, go through some examples. All right, so um, here's why we need a methodology. This is what tracks look like quite a bit. Um, even uh, this, the one on the left is even a prepared 
um, track station and uh, well the other two you know what how do you approach it even how do you deal with uh, tracks that are like that that you often see um, so really uh, what I'm going to remind those of you who have done tracking with us and for those of you new um, uh, hammer this down as a methodology you really have to narrow down the possibilities and then fine tune and decide so narrowing down uh, what you're doing is using clear prints and the track pattern and it's not the, it's really pretty straightforward if you have some decent tracks to come uh, given the shape and size of the tracks to come down to um, two or three maybe um, candidates for a given track or set of tracks and typically um, very common dichotomies in the field would be coyote versus domestic dog, red fox versus coyote, spotted striped skunk, bobcat, feral cat, and so forth and so on. So um, that's what we're going to we're going to take you through um, a few of those um, examples, and then uh, hopefully that will help you in the field too. But um, it's important, really important, always look at both the clear print and the track pattern. I have a lot of um, people who are actually around the country, around the world, send me a photograph of a track and they say, what the heck is this? And uh, very, most often it's a single track and it doesn't show the pattern. It doesn't show both front and hind. It shows one or the other. And um, so the, really when Mary and I are out in the field, we always, the, the first thing we do when we see track is match it up with the other tracks that belong with it, even though they may be the hardest ones to see. So you want to try to get a pattern as well as the clear print. So um, with regard to measuring tracks, this is a good um, essential for you to remember or to learn, which is that you're going to measure the width and length of the track and the bottom of it, it's called minimum outline method, would be another word for it, or the bottom of the track. And the coyote track on the left is shows you a, a typical way that you would um, measure that. And if you if you look at the uh, a track being made and the toes are going to be somewhat curved at the bottom, and so there's the floor of the track, and just at that point where the toe on either side or in the front or the heel pad in the back, just at the point at which those um, th that floor begins to curve up into the f wall of the track is what you measure. Now, interestingly, these two tracks are reproduced at the, exactly the same scale, and th they are both of the same coyote um, walking in the same trail and stepped in wet, wet sand on the left and later on the trail walked through dry sand. So uh, this is showing you on the right track how you would need to measure the width and length of that track to be accurate. So yeah, it looks impossible, but uh, with a little experience, you can play around with how much the soil collapses. And that is going to be your most important thing, your raw material. So um, what I had done is I I'd posted a, um, a little tracking workbook that you might, might have been able to download if you uh, saw the memo uh, soon enough, we're able to print that out. So it's a little, uh, little workbook. It's not a field guide. It's just a, a kind of a methodology to show you um, how to approach the um, categorization of tracks and the methodology. So if you don't have, have this one, don't worry, we'll just follow along. So what we try to do um, with the clear prints is to put them in categories depending on the number of toes and the shape and whether they're claws or not and so forth. So if you have that workbook and look at page two, um, the cat family, the felids, uh, four toes in the front, four on the hind, and um, no claws. So there are a couple of things about um, the cats to remember. The bottom of the heel pad, as that illustration shows, uh, almost always shows uh, three lobes, the top of the heel pad, both front and hind, uh, instead of coming to a point, is flattened off or uh, dipped a little bit. And the third thing is that um, the cat tracks are asymmetrical. 
Uh, in other words, if you uh, looked at your uh, left hand, and this is a left track without the thumb, and that middle finger, which is out ahead of it, that shows you the offsetness of that uh, track. And yes, um, other groups of, of species, including the canids, have some offset uh, characteristic, but not like the, the cat. So um, I'm going to give you just a, a few examples to show you how we approach it, but otherwise we're going to move on efficiently through these groups. But yeah, on the central coast, um, you're going to have domestic cat, bobcat, mountain lion, and you see how similar those uh, are in shape. Um, and a couple of uh, tips that there, there is a, a, um, an overlap in domestic cat versus bobcat in measuring. But here's a little trick that you can use with the bobcat versus house cat. So if you notice, um, this is a front track down here. And you'll notice that the heel pad of the front track, if you draw a, a line through from the middle of the bottom of the track through that, um, oops, um, you're going to draw it from the middle of the bottom of the track right through that notch. It's actually tilted or cantered to the outside a little bit on the front heel pad. Uh, and if you look at the domestic cat, the, the, high, the front track is on the top in that image. Um, that heel pad is pointed more straight ahead. Okay, so what about between mountain lion and um, bobcat? Well, um, we've seen juvenile bobcat, I mean, sorry, juvenile mountain lion tracks in the field. Um, and uh, coincidentally been able to see um, those animals um, pictured on trail cameras to where we could tell how large the animals were. So even a, a really small kitten with spots, a mountain lion kitten traveling with its mother, um, the hind track is going to be two inches wide or more. Uh, and of course, by the time that little mountain lion is traveling off by itself, its, its tracks will be way larger. So I think you will not have very much trouble distinguishing uh, a mountain lion and bobcat. So here's an image um, that's interesting. On the right is a female adult mountain lion. And uh, this trail on the left here, this is a adult bobcat. And um, so yeah, you'd say, why, why wouldn't this be a female mountain lion with a kitten? And the answer is, if you measured these, they would be way too small for, uh, for being a, a, um, a mountain lion. Now, a lot of people, many, many people, um, see what they think are mountain lion tracks and about 95% of what they report are big dog, if not something else entirely. <laughs> so uh, this is a useful thing that I want to, um, to provide for you. Um, and the kicker is in the next slide actually. But um, yeah, you, you see that the, um, you have the three lobes on the left tracks, which are mountain lion. And uh, mostly the dog tracks don't have three lobes, except uh, once in every six months, you might see a dog track with three lobes. So that's not the, that's not the um, end all of that argument. And also sometimes you'll see claw marks in mountain lion tracks in deep mud or something. Uh, sometimes you don't see claw marks in uh, dog tracks. And you go with the asymmetry of the mountain lion tracks, and that helps you out. But occasionally, that's troublesome with a big dog. So I'm going to tell you um, uh, the most important thing, though. If a dog track, a large dog track, measures and resembles um, a mountain lion track, it's only the front track that resembles it. It's not the hind track. So you have to find both the front and the hind track, which wouldn't be that hard. There's always going to be a hind track available. So here's what I'm talking about. Uh, this happens to be in the same image conveniently. 
um, the top image is as a of a mountain lion um, hind track and you see the uh, shape of the heel pad of mountain lion is uh, trapezoidal sort of you know big and tall and wide and the hind tracks of all the canids are, are short and squat with an emphasis of uh, kind of a little circle in the middle sometimes you see these the wings up here too and these are hind tracks of a, a canid so really in the field all you have to do is to find the hind track and um, you shouldn't have a problem at all okay now um, I'll tell you what I think I'm going to go I'm going to go through a couple of more um, categories of mammals uh, to give you some background and then I'll pause to see if um, if any of you might have some questions so um, so the canids um, yeah that's a, an issue um, in your field research um, with regard to uh, possibly red foxes and coyotes which we need to identify with the plover monitors, you know, out in on the coast and um, presence of um, kit fox versus gray fox. So that's a that's an issue too. So the canids, um, unlike the the felids, uh, have a heel pad, front heel pad that comes to a point more or less, as opposed to a notch. It's not asymmetrical as much as the um, as the as the felid track and you do have claws much of the time so here we have some choices that we would have locally in habitat coyote red fox domestic dog gray fox kid fox um, and so of course nowadays uh, now that we have been visited by um, the Oregon wolf which came down actually interestingly that wolf um, came within about seven miles of where Mary and I live and we never saw it we went out looking for tracks a few times and unfortunately it was hit by um, a vehicle about uh, eight or nine miles from from here but anyway now that we have the potential for um or realize the potential for gray wolves um wandering throughout the state we need to kind of address that and these are gray wolf tracks too um so uh let's get to the um a couple of the dichotomies with uh, a few tips that might help you out so this is so typical um when you're in the field uh domestic dog versus coyote and th there are a number of domestic dogs whose tracks measure in the coyote range. And so there are a few things that are important to know about this. Uh, the first being that the um, middle toes of a domestic dog um, are usually noticeably bigger than these outer toes. And doesn't take measuring, you just eyeball it. These two toes are bigger than those two toes. So that should uh, strike you. Um, and secondly, uh, the claw marks on a domestic dog are usually big and blunt, uh, as in these tracks here, whereas the wild canids, including the coyote, have uh, uh, much sharper claws. And then also the character of the trail and the, how the foot lands with uh, domestic dog. Domestic dogs are very sloppy walkers. So um, when you're beginning to get into tracking, you'll uh, right away maybe identify 80, 90% of, of this dichotomy correctly. And after a couple of months, you'll get 95 to 99%. You may have to work at them only some of the time. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of other dichotomies and then maybe we'll break for some questions. So this is common on the central coast actually, um, um, in, the, in the sand dunes and on the shore also in the central valley, coyote versus red fox. So um, the main thing you're looking for, if you can find it, 
is this is this uh, characteristic, uh, we call it a chevron, where the blue arrow is in the right photo. It's a, um, it's kind of a, people call it a callus pad or it's a ridge on the heel pad that registers in the track. And if you happen to have my field guide, uh, trackers field guide, or make a note of it to look at it later, if you go to page um, 93, there's a really good photograph of a front of a red fox showing that chevron. Okay, here's the problem. Um, that does not register in every track. Um, it depends on the substrate. And uh, what we've had, our, our experience in the field is you may have to follow a trail of the either or canid uh, you may have to look at 20 or 30 tracks before you find one that that either shows the chevron or is clear enough that it would show it if it if it did occur um, so you can see the bottom two tracks on the left photo and the right photo you can uh, contrast them so on another another tip that i would show you with um with uh, coyote versus red fox is a little more subtle, but you can notice this even in uh, tracks in dry sand on the dunes, um, and you'll get the hang of it and be pretty confident about it. And that factor is the shape of the heel pad on the hind track, not the front track. And uh, you notice that in the Red Fox, this little triangular heel pad is very often tucked up kind of bet uh, between those back toes, whereas the coyote heel pad is really set back a little bit and is more typical, your canid heel pad. Okay, all right. And, um, and then we get to gray fox versus kit fox. So this is something that might be uh, useful to some of you. I have people um, sending me photos to distinguish and of course, it's very important if you're um, dealing with the listed species. So um, there are uh, several things with the uh, kit fox versus gray fox. Um, one of them is the uh, shape of the front track. And uh, on the le in the left image, the left track is a um, is a front of a gray fox, and really, it's very much like a cat track because it's so round and unlike the oval canid tracks. So that's the difference between those, this one and that one, the shape and the position of the toes. And, um, and, and the second characteristic would be the presence of uh, claw marks in the kit fox track. So kit foxes being diggers, of course, show those all the time. And um, kit fox, I mean, a gray fox, you rarely see the claw marks. Okay. Um, and the reason being that gray foxes climb, you can see some great videos on uh, YouTube and whatever of climbing gray foxes. They're adapted to do that. And so that image will remind you that gray foxes are not going to show claws because they're semi retractile. And um, you know how um, you get up in the morning sometimes and um, you find tracks on the hood of your car and your local domestic cat has climbed up there? Well, gray foxes love to climb too. So uh, these are gray fox tracks. Actually, this photo is from Lompoc, coincidentally. All right. Oh, and, and then this slide. I will show you too. So getting back to the claw mark impressions, kit fox versus gray fox. So even when you don't have a really clear print, um, you can often tell the difference just by the impressions of the claws. So you see the the uh, the image on the left. Um, it just doesn't show any shadow of claws in this direct registering uh, gate. Uh, whereas you do see that in every track with the kid fox. Okay, so um, let me um, ask if there are any questions.
on any of what we've talked about? I think everybody knows this, but you need to unmute yourself if you have a question. Most of you are muted at this point. Nope. I have a question. Yeah. So do all cats just walk with their claws retracted? Like, is that pretty reliable? Or have you ever come across tracks, like cat tracks where there are claws? Uh, really, the only time I've seen uh, cat uh, claws in cat tracks, I, I remember mountain lion, maybe bobcat a couple of times. That would either be in a deep mud when the cat is, you know, like having grabbing to, um, on grab or going uphill maybe going up a steep slope okay and those uh -huh. are those but i've seen that i've seen that in in those two instances yeah, okay it's pretty rare but now and then yeah cool any other questions can you point out the uh the claw marks in that kit box yeah um okay in the top image these two little furrows right there and then uh right here and then you see a couple of furrows right here. Okay. Um, you know, really the key, uh, one key to tracking is uh, seeing the tracks as impressions of a moving foot, as opposed to just a stamp of a shape. And um, sometimes you'd have to get down and, and say, what caused that, you know? What could it be other than a, a claw mark? But um, if if you see what I'm saying, that's what it is. Okay, so let's um, move on then to some other categories, and um, we're going to show you the rest of the clear prints, and then get you into the um, uh, track patterns too. If we have time at the end, I have a couple of interesting examples of how to work through stuff. So anyway, um, in your workbook, if you have that, if you uh, were still on page uh, two, but the um, logomorphs, the rabbits and hares, um, well, we have cottontails and jackrabbits. Well, Audubon cottontail brush rabbit too. So um, this, I'm showing you this because it really is handy in the field because a, um, a rabbit or hare track is shaped very much like a canid track. It's um, egg shaped uh, with claw marks. So you could mistake a jackrabbit track easily for coyote track or a fox track for a um, cottontail. And uh, here's a tip that I am going to show you. So this is a right track on the left photo and um, you notice that it's asymmetrical, especially uh, these two outer toes. In other words, the outer toe is set back a little bit from the one across from it. So um, that is going to help you not go crazy when you see uh, tracks that you think are coyotes and are actually jackrabbits. And uh, you can kind of see over in the right image too um, of the cottontail that you have this track, that toe set back from the one across from it. Plus, the um, logomorphs also have a furred foot, so you're not going to see a really clear uh, heel pad with that. So um, so what's up with cattail versus jackrabbit? Part of it is, of course, size of the track, and part of it is the length of the leg. Uh, jackrabbits having such really long legs that the patterns they created are really extended and you can visualize uh, the reaching out capability of that. Um, okay, so um, when you get to the rodents, um, what I've done is in my workbook and uh, suggesting in your mind also to separate out the rodents that form a gallop pattern, the kind of the hopping, bounding um, pattern, which is really a gallop in my terminology. Um, 
from the ones who don't. So all the gallopers that are rodents, uh, the squirrels, the mice, chipmunks, wood rats, etc., uh, create this pattern where the two front feet are register and then the hind feet uh, land beyond them. And uh, you're going to see how that happens with the video in in a um, in a minute. So if if you looked at um, the like you you find a rodent pattern like this a galloper in the field with uh, you know four toes on the front and five on the hind so you know it's a rodent. Um, what you want to do is measure the trail width from the outermost part of the outer toes. Uh, this being a mouse. Uh, this being a wood rat and this being a ground squirrel. So the width of the trail is your fastest way to narrow down the possibilities because for any habitat, um, that trail width is going to come down to uh, a couple of possibilities. So you might have um, at Edwards Air Force Base, you might have antelope squirrel versus Mojave ground squirrel, or you might have um, in the chaparral, you might have wood rat versus um, versus uh, chipmunk, uh, or you might have um, fox squirrel versus red squirrel. I mean, uh, versus uh, gray squirrel. So that's the fastest way to get down to the narrowing down. And then you go to the field guides, and in my field guide and some others, there's really good tips on how um, to figure that out. Um, I will point out with the rodents that um, the K rats are exceptions to that uh, idea that the, the front feet have four toes and the hind feet have five because most uh, kangaroo rat species have four toes on the front. Uh, one interesting thing, of course, the, the K rats are, you know, bipedally hopping a lot of the time, but every now and then you see a gallop or a stop in which the the front foot is like between or behind the two hind. And um, when you see that, um, you can tell the difference between a K rat and, and a um, like a pocket mouse because the the front tracks of K rats are so much smaller than the corresponding hind ones. Um, okay, the <clears throat> there are groups of rodents that are um, that don't create a gallop pattern. And in the workbook, uh, page four lists those. Uh, the ones that you would have on the Central Coast would be pocket gopher and muskrat, and perhaps beaver too, um, in some places, or definitely beaver in some places. So uh, the one on the right, the muskrat, that's actually a diagonal walk, or it could be a trot. Actually, if you watch the kind of a trot uh, shuffle, and the pocket gopher is uh, uh, that's actually a trotting pattern on the on the left. Um, and the other candidates for rodents that are not gallopers uh, that would not be in our local habitat would include uh, porcupine and marmot. Um, so. Anyway, that's that group. Um, and let me do one other category and I'll see if you have questions too. Okay, so the, um, the next group um, in my workbook, um, actually weasels and skunks, um, five toes in the front and five on the hind. And these are typical uh, members of those uh, of that group that you might find. Uh, actually, spotted skunks uh, you see way less often than striped skunk, uh, but we have seen them in the, on the central coast. I think we saw them near Osaflaco a couple times and uh, maybe down in, uh, I forget where else. Uh, Badger, of course, is uh, can be throughout the, the sand dunes with the huge claw marks there. The difference between the spotted and striped skunks is in the segmentation behind the toes, and you can use the field guide for that. So, uh, yeah, weasels um, are very mysterious animals. They're, they're around more than people think they are, but we have rarely seen um, weasel tracks, and yet uh, the bottom 
left image is from um, the Central Coast uh, long tail weasel. Okay, um, are there any questions uh, in those groups? Hey Jim, this is David. I had a question on rodents and tail drag. Um, that's one thing I tend to see with the K rats, but didn't see in the photos with you know your shots there. Right. Are the tails useful as far as trying to determine who you've got or don't got? Um, I would find it useful sometimes with uh, pocket mice. Uh, versus other mouse species, but um, the, the the real answer is no, not too useful. And for the, uh, a couple of reasons, uh, for kangaroo rats, um, when uh, in the old days when they they used to study locomotion of different species, and um, well, you can find a K rat either at slow or fast speed, drag its tail or not drag its tail. Can, it can be either way, so uh, it's not diagnostic. And um, and the second thing to tell you, Mary and I were camped on the Colorado River once, and um, sitting around the campfire, and a little pocket mouse kept coming uh, with its you know long tufted tail. And um, well, we would leave a little nut or seed out because that that was my experiment, you know, smoothed out the area near the campfire and uh, half the time it came and dragged its tail the other half it didn't so and it didn't seem to have anything to do with the the uh, speed so um that's that's about all i can tell you with that any other questions okay we'll go through um a couple of other categories and then um, I want to show you some things about the track pattern and what you can do with it. So um, the that group on page four uh, that I just lumped together, raccoons, opossums, and bears, of course, not related to one another, uh, but we just lumped them together, all having five toes on the front and five on the hind. So raccoon tracks are pretty common. Everybody knows what those look like. Ringtail is interesting and um they're more around than people think there are mary and i keep seeing ringtail tracks in all kinds of habitats and the reason we do is that at last after years uh, we began to really know what the tracks look like or the variations in the tracks so uh, ringtail um, is technically a five-toed track and uh but Practically, it's a it's a four-toed track because if you see this, um, this is a hind track down at the bottom, and the inside toe is right there, and it really doesn't register very often at all. Even and it depends how the ringtail is moving. So a lot of times you just don't see it as a five-toed track, and you see it rather as a four-toed track, and and uh, try to make it a house cat or a um, gray fox, or uh, who knows what else. Uh, even kit fox sometimes it might resemble that. Um, but uh, so keep your eyes out, they're round. Uh, possum has that opposable thumb on the hind track, so you won't mistake it for anything else really. And uh, anyway, so that's the, that group. Um, and the last group I'm going to mention is um, the hoofed animals. And this would be the typical uh, candidates for what you might see in the field uh, and confuse with one another being the black tailed deer and uh, the feral pig. So if you see a lot of these tracks, uh, you won't have much of a problem because the feral pig are kind of blockier, rounder, not as much of a curved edge, uh, not coming to a point as much, but there are times when they might resemble or even measure uh, uh, similar to one another. So here's a, a tip that you might uh, find useful with um, the feral pig is that um, um, 
all the hoofed animal, the wild hoofed animals in California, except for the antelope, the pronghorn, have uh, dew claws, which are the vestigial toenails, so to speak, uh, up on the wrist. And um, the only time you'll really see those dew claws register in a deer track is if it's um, running, uh, which would be a lope, gallop, bound, or stop rather, uh, sometimes a trot. And uh, whereas the feral pig, are, you're going to see them when it's walking. And here's a dew claw right there and there that connect with, with that. Uh, and of course, the, the stride of a feral pig, the walking stride will be much less than a deer uh, of similar track size. So other than that, for the, um, for the um, hoofed animals, you have to go out of your way to find things that are not deer and uh, pig. And so these are bighorn, elk, and pronghorn. And you can go to the field guide and uh, see some characteristics about those. Okay. All right. So I want to um, give a little bit of time to the track patterns uh, and show you a couple of videos here too. So if you, um, and these are really essential for identifying tracks. So if you have my workbook and look at page eight, the upper right diagram is what's called diagonal walk. So if, or alternating track pattern. So if you see that, the categories are cats, dogs, hoofed animals, opossums, badgers, ringtails, muskrats, sometimes fishers. And there are two versions of a diagonal walk. One is direct and one is called indirect register. Okay, so I'm going to show you what a direct registering uh, track, how a track pattern is made that way. So you notice how the hind track is landing exactly where the front was. Play that once more. So you would ask yourself if the hind track is that precisely on top of the front, how do you know it's a double print and not a single print? Well, all of these animals that direct register the, the front track is bigger than the hind. So you'll see a shadow of uh, the front track underneath it if you look really carefully. So again, here are the, here's the list of the diagonal walkers. And the ones that direct register consistently are the foxes, all of the foxes, and the bobcat, mountain lion, lynx. Domestic cat, not so much, not so much as the bobcat. Okay, so, um, and on page eight, the bottom left, you have that gallop pattern that I was mentioning with the um, rodents. And so we have, if you find consistent gallop patterns, it's rabbit or hare or a rodent usually. And so here we go with how that's created. So you'll notice a lot of times these, these gallopers create the pattern, whether they're moving slowly or moving fast, the same pattern. And again, this is the trail width of a gallop pattern that would help you get to the identification. Um, and now we're going to show you um, on page eight, the lower right diagram, which is called a pace or overstep pattern. We have an image of a skunk track, striped skunk on the left and black bear on the right. So if you have a typical pace pattern, these are the animals that um, create that pattern. Skunks, bears, porcupines, marmots. Raccoon is a different kind of pace I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but also I have to tell you um, that um, 
mountain lions often pace and uh, the large legged dogs, long legged dogs often pace, especially um, domestic dogs. Okay, so here's Sorry about that. I was trying to. So you see with this um, in that walk, the hind leg moves beyond where the front was planted. And um, all these videos, by the way, are available on my for free viewing on my website or skills.com. Uh, there's a, a page, gate videos, um, and then animal movement videos also. Okay, and the last thing I want to show you is um, a kind of typical for a raccoon, which is, a, is technically a pace walk, but you see the raccoon pattern almost always have a front and hind, opposite front and hind right next to each other. Um, and yeah, raccoons also lope and gallop occasionally, but this is their almost always, this is their bread and butter. So this shows how the front, opposite front and hind are really next, land right next to each other. And this video you can look at on my website also. Okay, so um, I'm gonna sh go through this section and which will take a minute and then we'll go back to entertaining some questions. So um, I, I need to tell you um, in case you decide that you want me to look at some photos of some tracks that you've taken in the field. Um, if you encounter a photo in the field, please do the measuring even if you have a photo and it's the best thing really is measure it um, in in real soil as opposed to just having the ruler in the photo because you get a much more accurate measurement that way and a sixteenth of an inch or a millimeter or two really makes a difference very often in identifying a track. So um, when you record tracks and you want somebody else to look at it or at home or in your office, you want to uh, look at it yourself later. Um, first, take a photograph of the whole trail, of the series of tracks, and then take them one by one in segments because uh, you never know which of those tracks is going to be the, the, uh, the prime determination of what the, uh, what the animal is. Um, and then you want to also put the ruler in the track, in the in, in the photo of the track. So um, here's what, see, this is what be, people do sometimes. They'll send me a photo. And um, so and then I have to go measure my uh, car's key and see if I can recreate what size this track is. Or I've got to go, you know, measure, measure a quarter or a dollar bill and stuff like that. So yeah, please um, carry, carry a six inch ruler in your uh, gear pack, your tracking pack, and uh, and then put that in the, in the image. And uh, yeah, in desperation, this is a good friend of mine. He didn't have a ruler, so he had to put his big toe in there and uh, I had to tell him it's a, it's a wood rat track, but um, anyway, whatever. Okay. So let me um, let me see 
at the moment. If any of you have some questions, Hey, Jim, this is David again. Uh, yep. Random question, but you haven't thrown in any amphibians. Do you have any of the like Western toad that I've always found to be a, a fascinating track pattern? Um, no, I don't. I've, I've photographed um, the toad trails, but as far as isolating species, I'm, um, that's not my comfort zone. Okay. Uh, there is yeah, a good, cause... there is a good, good field guide though reptile amphibian tracks and so okay yeah because it took me i embarrassingly long time to figure out that it was toe drag and not claws that i was seeing out there exactly so. yeah it drags out on the exit exactly yeah i thought i had some little micro uh axe murderer type creature with huge claws <laughs> on it so thanks Any other questions? Okay, I, I, can I take a couple of minutes? Other questions? Okay, um, I'm gonna take a couple of minutes. I have a couple of examples um, to um, take you through. Okay, a um, couple of examples we don't have the clear print and you wonder what the heck to do with it. Um, so the first of the two examples uh, are some tracks in uh, Joshua Tree. So let's see how we would approach this. Well, <clears throat> they're, they're pairs of tracks, okay? Two tracks here two tracks here, two tracks here, two tracks here. And the hind tracks are somewhat covering over the tracks in front of it. Okay, so the first, and, and I'm gonna tell you also, the tracks measure uh, one and three fourths inches wide. All right, so here's how you would do it methodically. Um, well, it's a diagonal walker. Okay, um, so it's it cannot be a rodent. Uh, well, it could be a rodent if it were a diagonal walking rodent, maybe like a marmot, but in the desert, no, there's no rodent that would diagonal walk there. Okay, so therefore we're, we're eliminating all the uh, diagonal walkers. Uh, the, we're, uh, the rodents, the rabbits, um, and so what about uh, methodically through the, the um, other categories? Uh, well, these look like claw marks right here. So we're going to rule out the cats, uh, but we're going to rule in possibly uh, canids and uh, rule out rabbits. Um, okay, what about the weasel family? Uh, who in the weasel or skunk family would have a track one and three fourths is wide? Right, badger. That would be it in the desert habitat. That would be it. And then um, it's not a hoofed animal, raccoons, opossums, and bears. Um, the claw marks rules out the ringtail and the size too does. So what were we now? We're to a canid or a badger. So here's what I see. Well, and, and I'm gonna show you something else too. Uh, these claw marks are scraped and there's a big mound. It's called a disc behind the toes. This area is up and this area behind this track, the hind track is pushed up. And that is, these are all pushed up. So we know that this is not a uh, walk. This is a fast moving gait because the soil movement. 
Um, therefore, it has to be being paired. It has to be a trot. So whatever it is, it's trotting. Okay. And uh, here's uh, what I see is um, I see three claw marks being pushed back. Um, in a canid, you'd have two claw marks next to each other and a two more claw marks back here. You wouldn't have three, especially one out pointed in the front. So see how easy that is? Badger. Okay, even with marginal track where you don't see the detail. All right. And um, I'm going to show you one other, going to show you one other example too. This was a photo that a biologist had taken in a, uh, Edwards Air Force Base. So what do we have? We have a um, Regina Walker marked uh, left, right, left, right, left, right pattern. The size of the track is one and a half inches in uh, the width of the track. And the, and the stride from here to there is nine inches. So what are we doing with that? Okay, diagonal walker. Um, it could be a cat. It could be, a, well, given the size, if it's a canid, it could be a gray fox. And let's go through the other categories. It's not going to be a rodent. It's not going to be a weasel. You have a diagonal walk. Um, and then in the next category, yeah, it could be a ringtail. Okay, so those are the only possibilities. So let's get the track. It's as good as it gets for the clear print. And what I see is four toes. This is kind of asymmetrical. What do you think? It kind of looks like it could be a bobcat. But then, um, you see, when I look at tracks, uh, for me, everything has to be right. You have to have, be able to explain everything. And so how do we explain this little thing right there? That little dent. Okay. Well, if you have um, my field guide and you look at page um, 297, figure B, and that shows the hind track of a ringtail. And uh, in my book, this little uh, is mark is the inside toe of the of the um, right track. This happens to be, I mean, of the left track, and this happens to be a right track. So there we go. See how easy it is. Really, when we're in the that's what we do. We just be methodical, go through why, why it it cannot be something, until you get to the right answer. Um, so um, anyway, that's the wisdom we're going to leave you with. All right, we've uh, we've talked uh, talked to some of you folks before about doing a um, a field class and would love to do one maybe uh, in fall, now that you've had a little experience or an introduction into how to identify trucks. So when you get in the field, then you have a lot of possibilities to not only identify tracks, but visualize how the animal's moving. You get speed, posture, you get head turns, you get sniffing, hesitations, you get uh, body language, um, not to mention how the habitat is being used. So there are a lot of possibilities out there in the field. And so uh, hopefully in the future we can put something together and, uh, and we'll get you out in the, in the sand or the mud or whatever it happens to be. So thank you all for um, being part of this. Yeah, thank you, James. Yeah, that would be great later in, in the season. That would be great to have a in-person workshop. Can you promise us gray wolf? <laughs> no, actually, see, I expected, actually, I expected a, um, 
a question about gray wolf versus domestic dog track. So, um, I, and I don't have time to give her give a the, the answer that she would look at. So hopefully, yeah, by, by maybe by this fall we'll get her visitor forth. Great. Okay, and let me just mention again that my website, uh, earthskills.com, uh, it has a lot of resources. It has free downloads. It has uh, videos of uh, animal movement and gates. Um, then it has some uh, books and uh, monographs and so forth. And then um, I, I know some of you would have my field guide, the trackers field guide. And what you don't know is there's a, no, a new edition coming out um, September 1st. So it'll be the third edition of it. So Exciting. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. This was this was great. Yes, thanks, James, for presenting. And thank you, everyone, for attending. This was a, a great uh, another virtual lecture series. And uh, yeah, keep an eye out for details for uh, next month for May's. Um, we will send out another uh, reminder. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining and uh, yep, uh, enjoy your Tuesday and uh, get tracking. Thanks everybody. See you next time. Thank you, that was fantastic. <laughs>